Yeah, oh, so uh, hello everybody. Uh, thank you very much for coming to this talk. So I will talk about Hamiltonian addition methods. Uh, this is a joint work with Chris Madison, uh, EY Tech, uh, Brendan Donog, and Arno Dusse. Okay, so uh, I'm going to be bold and uh, write on the blackboard, uh, whiteboard uh, most of the time, but uh, I have a few slides for the uh, uh, figures. So uh, my first uh, figure is uh, basically to show you the type of uh, uh, ideas that we can do. So uh, if you try to optimize a function that's uh, growing faster than quadratic, usually uh, gradient descent or uh, classical momentum methods, they do not give you linear rates. Uh, um, and uh, especially if, if the function is uh, known uh, strongly convex at its minimum. But uh, our new Hamiltonian addition methods can still give you uh, linear convergence rates. Okay, so uh, I'm going to explain the setting first. So you have a function fx uh, uh, r d to r, and uh, our goal is to minimize f. Um, okay, and then. Uh, what we are focused on is first order methods. So you only have uh, access to the gradient of F, but not higher order derivatives. And uh, a goal is to, okay, I will write uh, uh, linear rates, okay, which is uh, uh, F, x i minus f x star less than equal to c times lambda to the minus i for some uh, zero uh, less than one. So uh, this is our goal. And uh, x star is the global minimizer of x. So Right, I'm going to uh, explain the standard conditions in convex optimization for obtaining linear rates like this. So these are called the uh, 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 strong convexity and smoothness. So basically, uh, you want uh, So want this inequality to hold uh, for every x and y in Rd. So uh, if f is twice differentiable, then this is equivalent to the fact that mu times the identity matrix is uh, lower bounding the Hessian of f, and uh, that's upper bounded by L times the identity matrix. So, uh, in, but uh, this is also uh, applicable to functions that are not twice differentiable. But basically, this is uh, the standard conditions in uh, optimization for obtaining uh, these rates. So in particular, any function that grows faster than a quadratic rate does not satisfy these assumptions. And also, any function that is uh, 
degenerate that has a Hessian that's uh, zero in the minimum also doesn't satisfy these conditions. So uh, what uh, the good thing about these conditions is that uh, we do know that only assuming these, uh, they're quite sharp upper and lower bounds on optimization. So uh, if, uh, if you make the following assumption that uh, uh, I will go with N because of Nesterov. So we assume that XK is in the span of uh, um, Uh, X. So you are in the span of the gradients of the previous iterates. Then, uh, uh, then Nesterov shown that uh, there is exists a function f satisfying uh, this inequality uh, one. One that uh, f x k minus f x star is greater than or equal to mu over two times uh, x zero minus x star square times uh, square root of kappa minus one over square root of kappa plus one to the two k. And the kappa here is just uh, mu over L. So you basically what this says is that you can't go faster than uh, one minus one over square root of kappa, roughly. Uh, that is the best rate you can get if you only assume this about F. And uh, uh, and then uh, there's an upper bound for, uh, so for when using just the standard gradient descent, which is uh, x k minus epsilon times gradient of f x k, then you have a rate uh, f uh, x k minus f x star is less than or equal to L over two times uh, one minus uh, two epsilon mu L over mu plus L, okay, times the x zero minus x star square, where um, you need to assume that epsilon is uh, less than uh, two over uh, mu plus L. So, uh, all right, the thing that this gives you is only uh, basically roughly one minus one over kappa. So it's not even as fast as the uh, lower bound, but there is a different version of gradient descent that's called the accelerated gradient descent by uh, Nesterov. So what it differs from the gradient descent, descent itself is that it has a second order correction in terms of the previous gradient at x k minus one as well. I'm not going to describe you the formula exactly, but uh, what it gives you is that you can get the same rate like this uh, up to this constant, even this constant is the same. So the exact same, uh, convergence rate that's the uh, lower bounds give you. Now, uh, uh, another type of algorithm that's a bit different from uh, gradient descent, but it has been uh, very popular, is a Poyax heavy ball method.
also called the momentum method. So uh, uh, the idea is that you look at the differential equation of the following form, x derivative equals to p, which is the momentum, and p derivative equals to minus uh, gradient fx minus gamma times p. So uh, what happens here is that uh, uh, if you wouldn't have this term, then this would be just a standard uh, Hamilton Nian equation. So, but this term is a friction term that decreases your momentum, so it makes you converge towards the minimum. And uh, if you look at the discretization of this ODE, then uh, you can obtain the following simplest uh, discretization, which is uh, by explicit scheme. Um, Um, minus epsilon times gamma times pk. So you just make a epsilon uh, steps and you get this discretization. And uh, what is known about this method is that uh, the uh, convergence rate for uh, um, under assumptions one, uh, it gives you a, um, so it gives you a similar rate as the gradient descent. Uh, but for quadratic functions, it's uh, known that in this specific case of quadratic f, you get uh, essentially the optimal rates. So uh, what's uh, expected in this case is that uh, you have, uh, once you get near the minimum, you will get a good rates because it's approximately quadratic there. So these are very popular in uh, uh, optimization, especially for uh, deep learning type of uh, algorithms. So, uh, now, uh, a key idea of our work is that uh, we look at the generalization of the system when using uh, different kinetic energies. So uh, these are also called the conformal Hamiltonian systems. So the equation is the following. So your... Uh, the derivative of the position is just the gradient of some kinetic energy, K, and the derivative of the momentum is minus the gradient of the function Fx minus gamma times P. So the only thing that changed is that we replace this term here from uh, P to gradient Kp. And uh, when k equals to p square over two, you obtain the same thing as before. Uh, and uh, okay, so I'm going to call this uh, um, two. So this is a conformal Hamiltonian system. And uh, what we are going to assume is that uh, k is a convex function. So it's going to be strictly convex. That means that uh, any point, uh, so basically strict convexity means that uh, k lambda times x plus one minus lambda times y is uh, strictly less than k x uh, times lambda plus uh, k y times one minus lambda when lambda is between uh, zero and one. And uh, we assume that k is zero is zero. Okay, so what we are going to see is that uh, if you choose uh, k 
in a way that uh, matches f in the minimum and uh, in the tails in the powers in a certain way, then this system will converge at a linear rate and also is discretization, so it's useful as an optimization method. Whereas for the same type of things like uh, this, the gradient descent and the standard method with uh, just standard kinetic energy wouldn't give you the linear rates. So by choosing, uh, using this flexibility in K, you can obtain uh, methods that are ab applicable to a wider class of convex functions. So uh, uh, I'm going to explain this better. In the, for example, this function here has a power behavior of uh, x to the fourth power in the tails. So k will be uh, related to the convex conjugate. So uh, basically, the uh, I'm going to explain this uh, now. So uh, the definition, uh, convex conjugate. So uh, if H is a RD to R uh, convex function, then uh, if we define H star uh, P as a uh, the supremum of uh, x in Rd um, uh, gradient, okay, the scalar product of x p minus the h x. So, uh, what you need to know about this that uh, this function always we we define it on Rd but it might take value as a plus infinity at some points. So the, the domain where it is finite might not be the wall of Rd. But uh, uh, in the cases that we'll consider, it will typically be the wall set of Rd. And uh, now, uh, what's good about this is, uh, first of all, if you look at a function uh, hx equals to uh, x transpose a matrix A times x over two, then the, the convex conjugate of this function, as long as A is a positive definite matrix, is uh, uh, h star x p will be equal to P transpose A inverse P over two. Okay, and uh, then uh, another example is that when HX equals to X two norm power to the uh, P, oh, no, sorry, uh, A. Okay, let's just look at one dimension. So. Uh, uh, x to the a over a, then uh, h star p is uh, p to the absolute value over b over b, where 1 over a plus 1 over b equals to 1. Okay, so uh, this is the conjugacy relationship between the powers. So uh, for example, if A is equal to two, then B is also equal to two. So in that case, they are the same power. But uh, what we see here is that when you choose A to be four, so it's a fourth power in F, then you will choose uh, the kinetic energy to be of the four over third power. Then they will satisfy this condition. And uh, the, there's this uh, inequality that's quite uh, uh, useful, is the so-called uh, Fenchel-Young inequality. So uh, um, uh, 
Okay, so this is uh, going to be quite useful. So this follows directly from the definition of the convex conjugate. And uh, now, the uh, good thing about this convex conjugate is that uh, if you choose k to be uh, bounding the convex conjugate from above, then you will be able to show uh, that uh, the system, uh, the conformal Hamiltonian system, converges with a linear rate. So I'm going to state this uh, proposition here. So uh, first, uh, we define the centered version of f as, uh, in this way. So basically, uh, uh, this is just a shift, shifted version of f that takes its minimum at zero, and the minimum value is also zero. And uh, if assume that uh, k p is greater than or equal to uh, some constant alpha times f star, f c star minus p, okay? And then uh, alpha is between uh, uh, zero and one, okay? Let uh, h uh, x p be the Uh, this is the difference in F plus uh, K P. So this is the so-called Hamiltonian uh, uh, of the system. So it's just the sum of the function uh, plus the, the kinetic energy. And then uh, we define the Yapunov function V X P as uh, this H plus uh, some constant beta times the scalar product x minus x star, oh, sorry, uh, p. So then uh, the following claims hold. So d um, for uh, gamma, inside the uh, zero one, beta inside the, uh, okay, uh, uh, zero uh, alpha times gamma over two. Uh, we have a d over dt v x t p t, okay, less than equal to minus beta times uh, one minus gamma times uh, V X T P T. And uh, moreover, we have uh, V uh, X T P T is greater than or equal to alpha minus beta over alpha times H X T P T, which is uh, greater than or equal to alpha minus beta over alpha times F X T minus F X star. Okay, so uh, basically uh, we have a linear contraction for this Yapunov function V, and this Yapunov function upper bounds your distance in F to the minimum by a constant factor. So uh, now I'm going to prove this result. So uh, it's a quite a, a simple, but before that, uh, okay, uh, this figure shows the uh, way that uh, you have a standard Hamiltonian field that wouldn't converge anywhere, plus this dissipation field that contracts P, and together they are like 
converging in this uh, uh, turbulent fashion to the minimum. And then uh, uh, the next figure shows uh, what happens here when you choose uh, k in a way that corresponds to the uh, convex conjugate. So it's exactly the convex conjugate. Then you have a nice linear convergence, uh, as you can see on the top. And uh, when you choose uh, uh, k to be the standard kinetic energy, which is much smaller for small p than the convex conjugate, as you can see for small p, this doesn't satisfy that it's a, a lower bounding this upper bounding the convex conjugate by a factor of alpha, then you do not have uh, the linear rate, but it's just a polynomial rate in the convergence here, as you can see. So uh, it's a different behavior. Sorry, can you repeat that again? So which, uh, which algorithm here using? So now I'm looking at the, okay, I'm going to explain you how to discretize this, but this is just about the ODE itself. Uh, uh, okay, so which ODE are you talking about? I'm talking about this ODE, oh, the conformal Hamiltonian system. Uh, this is the ODE I'm going to work. Uh, what matters is the value of k, is it 10 or k0? Both. Well, the k0 you need to know x star. So, but, you don't need to know x star because you need to know the f, it's related to the yeah, conjugate of the centered version. Yeah, but you, don't know the center. you don't need to know the center, you only need to know whether it has, a, what is the uh, behavior in the power, what is the power behavior near the minimum. So for example, if you have a... Okay, so uh, uh, that's uh, something, uh, okay, if you know that the minimum is uh, non-degenerate, for example, you assume that uh, the Hessian is non-zero, then it will be always satisfied this type of condition. All right, that's it. So, uh, okay, I will going to explain you later on, but uh, if you, Note that the, if the Hessian is uh, degenerate at the minimum, then you sort of uh, need to know what is the power there if you want to get linear rates. Uh, this is a thing that's needed. Uh, maybe there will be a ways to do this adaptively, but for the moment, uh, uh, if you fix K uh, from the beginning, it has to match the power but you don't need to know where is the minimum located. That has nothing to do with the location of the minimum. It just has to do with the power behavior near the minimum, which might be known in some example. So, uh, all right. And uh, now, uh, the next uh, thing I'm uh, going to do is to prove this. So, uh, you have a minus uh, x minus x star, uh, P equals to uh, x minus x star minus P minus F C x minus x star plus F C x minus x star. So, uh, and then uh, now uh, these parts, you use the definition of the convex conjugate to upper bound this by F C star uh, minus P plus f c x minus x star. And then now you use the assumption uh, here to uh, upper bound this by uh, k, okay, uh, k uh, p, uh, over alpha plus uh, f c x minus x star, which is uh, uh, exactly, okay, which is uh, uh, good. And now, uh, 
by uh, multiplying this by beta, you obtain that uh, beta times uh, x minus x star p is bigger than or equal to minus beta over alpha times uh, h x p. And then, uh, and this implies that uh, v x p is greater than or equal to uh, alpha minus beta over alpha times uh, h x p. So as long as beta is less than alpha, then this the open of function v upper bounds the h, and that upper bounds fx minus fx star. And then if you look at the derivative of this thing, uh, then um, by uh, uh, first you can compute the derivative of fxt minus fx star. That will give you a gradient of fxt, uh, gradient of kpt. The derivative of uh, k is a uh, minus of the gradient fxt, gradient kpt. And then uh, you have a minus gamma times uh, gradient of kpt, uh, pt. And then the, the third term is uh, Um, yeah. And then uh, you have uh, this. So, um, so what we need to show uh, is that uh, the um, is it minus uh, gamma minus beta times uh, k p t minus uh, beta times uh, f uh, x t minus f x star. Mm. Um, minus uh, um, beta times gamma times uh, xt minus x star pt is uh, less than or equal to uh, minus beta times uh, 1 minus gamma times kpt minus beta times uh, 1 minus gamma times f xt minus f x star and then a minus beta squared times 1 minus gamma times uh, xt minus x star uh, pt. So uh, the way I come with the upper part is just uh, writing uh, the derivative of vt and using the fact that this is uh, greater than or equal to, to kpt and this is greater than or equal to fxt minus fx star by the convexity. And uh, now, if you just want to show uh, that the derivative of kpt um, will be uh, less than or equal to this, then uh, by rearrangement, uh, you only need to show that uh, minus beta times uh, gamma minus beta times 1 minus gamma times uh, this scalar product is uh, less than or equal to um, k gamma minus by a combination of k uh, and f f x star and this follows from the uh, inequality uh, that we proved uh, here. So, uh, so we have uh, sh shown uh, this uh, key result. So basically, as long as you can uh, find a k that up upper bounds fc star everywhere by a constant alpha, 
uh, then uh, you are uh, you get linear rates in continuous time, and uh, now I'm going to uh, uh, show a uh, uh, converse result. So So, um, so if you uh, if you choose a, a, a b uh, greater than one, and uh, that their uh, reciprocs are the sum of their reciprocs is less than one, and uh, you choose k p as uh, uh, p to the a over a, and fx as uh, x to the b over b, then uh, the uh, then what happens is that uh, xt inverse equals to order t to the one over b a minus A minus B um, as uh, T tends to infinity for almost, uh, for Lebesgue, almost every X zero, P zero. So uh, what happens is that uh, you have a polynomial convergence rate as long as you do not match the powers and uh, this holds for every initial point except for one particular part. So as you can see uh, on the first uh, slide, uh, for a typical part, the convergence rate in this case will be polynomial and not uh, linear. But there's a unique part where you get a linear rate. So. Uh, Basically, the reason is that this assumption here is not satisfied for any alpha bigger than zero. It only holds for alpha equals to zero in this case when you uh, have such powers. And, uh, okay. Yeah, so. So, uh, now, uh, I'm going to, uh, uh, generalize the result there to uh, adaptive alpha. So first, I will need the following assumption. So um, A1 is that F, okay, D minimum uh, x star. A2 is that uh, k uh, strictly convex uh, k0 equals to 0 is the minimum. And uh, A3 is the uh, gamma is in uh, 0, 1. And uh, A4 is the key assumption is that uh, there is a function alpha uh, zero infinity to uh, zero one, such that it's uh, non-decreasing, non, okay, non-increasing. Convex. And uh, KP is uh, greater than or equal to uh, alpha KP times uh, maximum of uh, 
f c star p f c star minus p. Okay. For every p, so it's a. This is a generalization of this setting here because uh, you make uh, alpha uh, position dependent, and uh, in particular in the tails, it can tend to zero. So, for example, in this setting, if you choose one over a plus one over b to be bigger than one, then uh, in the tails, k will be much, uh, growing much more slowly than the convex conjugate of f. But uh, you can make this work with alpha tending to zero in the tails. This condition still be valid. So uh, now the uh, following uh, result holds uh, under Assumption A, uh, if you let P0 to be 0, and uh, W0 equals to uh, Fx0 minus Fx star, and, and you define WT derivative as uh, 1 minus gamma, okay, minus 1 minus gamma times uh, C yeah, C alpha gamma times uh, alpha 2 W T times W T, uh, then uh, uh, W T Uh, f x t minus f x star is uh, less than or equal to uh, two w t, and that is uh, less than or equal to uh, um, two times uh, um, um, f x zero minus f x star times exponential uh, minus uh, um, integral of the alpha to w t dt from zero to t. So what this uh, means is that uh, what matters is the average alpha that as you get closer to the minimum, you might get better and better rates. And this average is what mat drives the rate. It's not the worst case. And uh, the, for this, uh, there's an additional assumption here that I forgot. So. Uh, you have a uh, minus uh, uh, C alpha gamma times alpha derivative Y times Y is assumed to be less than uh, alpha Y for every uh, Y uh, in a zero infinity. Okay, so, uh, so this is what, uh, it means so, uh, and uh, basically, uh, now we have shown some results for continuous time process, but these are not uh, useful by themselves. We need to show that uh, if you discretize this, you still get uh, similar rates. So, the first uh, method that we consider is the implicit method. which is uh, xi plus one minus xi 
equals to epsilon times the gradient of k pi plus 1. And uh, pi plus 1 minus pi equals to minus gamma times pi plus 1 minus gradient f xi plus 1. OK? So it's possible to show under the first two assumptions only that there's a unique solution to this, and it's well defined. And uh, however, uh, only using these assumptions is not sufficient to show uh, convergence for this method. So we need an additional assumption, which I call assumption B. B, which is that uh, uh, the gradient of fx and the gradient of kp, uh, the, their scalar product is upper bounded by the constant times the Hessian of uh, xp for every x and p. So um, now we are going to see why Thus, this is a reasonable assumption. And uh, now, in the following proposition holds for the implicit scheme. Uh, if uh, under A, B, if uh, for a step size uh, epsilon below an absolute constant, uh, CFK1, you have, uh, if you denote V0 as uh, Fx0 minus Fx star, and your initial momentum is zero, then uh, Vi plus one times uh, Okay, so so this times alpha two WI. Uh, over 4 to the minus 1, then uh, fxi uh, minus fx star is less than or equal to w, 2 times wi. So basically, uh, in each uh, step, you decrease by a factor of epsilon times a constant times uh, alpha to wi, which is adapted to the current position. and. Uh, so uh, even if your uh, convex conjugate doesn't upper bounds the, no, if k doesn't upper bounds the convex conjugate by a constant alpha, but by an alpha that tends to zero in the tails, it still can work. And uh, now uh, I'm going to show why uh, this uh, assumption is necessary. So assumption B. So in this case, uh, uh, an example where this arises is the, is the case when you choose uh, uh, 1 over a plus 1 over b bigger than 1. Uh, yeah, so if uh, in this case, your, what happens is that k uh, k over the convex conjugate tends to infinity at the minimum. So the conditions for the continuous time uh, result, they hold, at least uh, locally. So you, you would expect it to converge at a geometric rate. And uh, that is what happens. So the continuous time process converges at a linear rate as before, but it gets very, very wavy. And the time between uh, uh, positions when you cross the minimum becomes faster and faster. 
And uh, that basically means that it becomes almost impossible to discretize. And uh, the discretization also doesn't converge is at uh, geometric rate anymore. So this assumption is really crucial for making the method work. Uh, so there's a difference between the continuous time and the discrete time version in this case. But uh, now, uh, okay, so this is an implicit scheme, but it's not very useful by itself because uh, you still need to solve this uh, implicit equation that's not uh, that easy. And uh, so we propose some explicit method as well. That's uh, basically uh, of the following form. Uh, Okay, I call this E. Um, and uh, now I need uh, some additional assumptions to make it uh, work. Okay, C. So first of all, uh, C1 is that uh, the gradient of K, P, P, let's say equal to CK times uh, KP. The C2 is that uh, F is uh, twice differentiable. For every uh, X, except perhaps the minimum. And uh, C3 is that uh, the, this uh, quadratic form that's uh, made from um, F and K. So there's a Hessian of F in the middle and there's two gradients of K from the two sides is upper bounded by uh, some constant d, f, k, um, times the alpha free h, x, p, times the Hamiltonian h, x, p. So this is the three additional assumptions that we need. And the uh, and, uh, result that we obtain is that uh, for uh, so there's a constant that's, that that depends on the previously defined constants. Uh, um, uh, okay. So if you choose epsilon to below, be below that, then uh, the, and you define vi plus one to be uh, uh, vi divided by uh, one plus epsilon times uh, another <coughs> constant uh, that de depends on the same constants here, times alpha two wi. Um, then uh, f uh, x i minus f x star is less than or equal to two w i. So, all right. So uh, we got a very similar results as here, but uh, we need these additional assumptions. And uh, to check these, uh, we propose a family of kinetic energies. Uh, which 
uh, is called uh, power kinetic energies. So, uh, Uh, basically, uh, they look like uh, uh, we call it Phi A capital A P uh, conjugate norm. Uh, so this uh, okay. So for a given norm, uh, uh, okay. So for this given norm. We define the P, the conjugate norm, as the supremum of the XP, where uh, the norm of uh, X is less than or equal to 1. And um, we define this function phi A capital A T as uh, 1 over capital A times uh, T to the small a plus 1 to the capital A over small a minus 1 over a. So this behaves like uh, t to the a over a for t tends to infinity and t to the small a over a for t tends to 0. So and it's defined for t in uh, 0 infinity. So. Um, now, basically, this is a general uh, class of uh, kinetic energies that can have different power behavior near the minimum and in the tails. So they, as you can see, they grow like capital A power in the tails and uh, small a power in the minimum. And uh, the, okay, so sorry. This is the figure that shows uh, that these different behaviors for different values of small a and uh, capital A. And uh, now, uh, the key point of uh, using these is that, uh, first of all, you can show that this assumption holds for them for some constant that depends on small a and capital A. And then the other point is that uh, conditions like this or this can be shown by the fenchel young inequality that allows you to separate these two terms and just obtain conditions only on F without the relation of uh, K and F anymore. And the good thing about this as well is that the conjugate of, uh, if you define K as this, then you know that uh, K star, uh, P is always lower bounded by phi B B um, P norm, where uh, 1 over B plus 1 over A equals to 1, 1 over A plus 1 over B equals to 1. So basically, the if you take the conjugate powers, then uh, the corresponding uh, power kinetic energies are almost the same as their conjugates. And they're strictly upper bounding their conjugates. So these are very useful. And based on this and the French are young, you can come up with conditions that allow you to, to show all of these in terms of only conditions on F. So um, all right. And uh, for example, uh, if you know the power of uh, F, both in the near the minimum and in the tails, then uh, this set of assumptions only on F uh, allow you to show that uh, you all of the previous assumptions A, B, C hold with a constant alpha. But for this, you need to match the tails uh, so you, you need to use the conjugates of the powers of F as in your kinetic energy, both in the minimum and in the tails. And uh, in this other set of assumptions, we use uh, a particular choice of uh, 
kinetic energy, which is a 2, 1. So this is the so-called relativistic kinetic energy, phi uh, 2, 1. So it's, uh, okay, so it's uh, quadratic in the minimum, but uh, linear in the tails. So it's called the relativistic. And uh, this has the good property that uh, in this case, by choosing uh, alpha in a, depending on the tail behavior of F, these assumptions A, B, C will uh, be satisfied for any function that grows faster than quadratic rate in the tails, and it's quadratic in the minimum, so not de non degenerate. So you can get uh, linear rates that are, and your step size epsilon can be chosen to be independently of the position for any function that grows uh, faster than quadratically. And for these cases, the, the gradient descent and the standard momentum do not work well because the further out you are in the tails, the smaller the step size you need to take not to diverge because the gradients can be massive in the tails. So it makes them very slow for this type of functions, whereas uh, this method will converge uh, very well even in this case, and you don't need to worry about tuning your epsilon depending on the initial position. And so this is an example that you can see. So uh, when you look at the function phi 2, 8, x, so this has 8 power in the tails and the quadratic in the minimum. So in this case, the gradient descent is very slow when you start far away from the minimum, so like 100 or 25. If you start very close to the minimum, then it works well because it's quadratic there. Now, if you look at the uh, exact convex conjugate, then you are always very fast uh, linear rate. Uh, now, if you choose this uh, relativistic, then what happens is that your alpha in the tails is not very big, okay? It's, it's not too small either, but it tends to the zero quite slowly in the tails. So initially, you are a bit slow, but then when you get closer, you are getting faster and faster, and also here as well. So it adapts nicely to the uh, function without knowing the power in the tails at all, and uh, it's much it works much better than gradient descent. And uh, um, yeah, so that's it. Uh, okay, so uh, that's the end of my talk. Uh, uh, feel free to ask me some questions. Uh, so, uh, okay, uh, ba basically, if you know something about the tail behavior of the function, you can use that information to uh, improve. But this type of, uh, in general, you might not know, but it's typical for many cases that the function grows faster than quadratically. So in that case, this relativistic kinetic energy is a safe choice because it's very stable. And it's also very widely used in deep learning methods because uh, it's this property of uh, of stability is uh, very useful. Um, so this is the most popular uh, K that uh, people use uh, in uh, practice. Yeah. So uh, we're running behind, so what I suggest is we just have 10 minutes of coffee break and we come back in 10 minutes time. And uh, if you have further questions, Daniel will ask them. Okay, thank you.